You're listening to The Real Investment Show. So a few things kind of wrapping up this week. Of course, Friday is options expiration day. Uh, We've got record number of options out there right now. So again, uh, we haven't had a lot of volatility in the market as of late. It's been very quiet. Um, Ever since we kind of got the sell signal on the markets, we really haven't gone anywhere. Markets have just kind of been consolidating sideways here about over the last week. That's good news, actually. Uh, As long as this market can just kind of go sideways, it's a way to kind of work off this overbought condition. Um, Sell signals are still in place currently, but again, that just suggests that prices really don't have to go anywhere. It doesn't mean you have to have a big correction. So again, uh, looking for an opportunity here as we get past Thanksgiving and get into the month of December, um, potentially we're going to see an opportunity for that Santa Claus rally. So kind of want to get positioned for that. Be a little bit cautious here the first two weeks of December, as we've talked about before, that's mutual fund distributions coming up. Let me just say this one more time. I said this the other day, and I always get a tremendous number of emails and phone calls uh, of people in panic right in the first couple of weeks of December. They'll call me up and say, I don't understand why my mutual fund just declined by 1% today. Um, Just all of a sudden, it just went down 1% or whatever it is. Well, that's the distribution. And what's going to happen is, is that you're going to see a sharp drop in your mutual fund. And this only applies to mutual funds. This doesn't apply to ETFs or individual stocks, but you'll see it in mutual funds. So if you own mutual funds, your 401k plan, IRA, et cetera, you're going to see a drop. And that drop is when that fund makes its distribution. Now, and don't panic over this. This is just the normal process. You'll see the price drop when they make that distribution. In a couple of days, you will either receive your shares of the new fund if you're doing dividend reinvesting, or you'll have a cash deposit if you're having you know everything paid out in cash to you. Uh, you'll have a cash deposit in your account and your account will rebalance. So don't freak out over the big declines that will come up in mutual funds. So it's a one, two day event. It'll be over with, mutual funds reside. And interestingly enough, I tell people, I have one person that calls me every year. It's the same person. We have the same conversation every year. So (laughs) just, and they're not even a client. They're just a friend. (laughs) So... Anyway, yeah, we don't use mutual funds, so I don't have to worry about this. Anyway, uh, a couple other things this morning. Uh, you know, it's always interesting when you hear on the media about fact checkers and about the spread of misinformation. Well, talk about the spread of misinformation. This morning, I'm driving in listening to work, and of course, Janet Yellen now talking about the fact that December the 15th, that we were expecting December the 3rd was going to be kind of the runoff date for the treasury to be able to pay its bills. It's now moved out to December the 15th, so it gave us a couple of extra weeks here. But coming in this morning is like, well, Janet Yellen says that she's got till December the 15th but to avoid the first ever default on U.S. Treasury debt. That is not true. We have defaulted on our debt previously, several times actually throughout history. Uh, they were technical defaults, but they were defaults nonetheless. And that's all this would be as well. If we fail to raise the debt ceiling, could we default on our debt? Yes, we may have a technical default. What is a default on debt? Debt is a debt default is simply the failure to make the interest payment. Doesn't mean that you didn't, and it could mean also not repayment of principal, but in this case, it would be the failure to make a timely interest payment on the debt, right? That would be a technical default. As soon as the funding bill was passed, the debt ceiling was raised, we would then make that payment within a couple of days or whatever. So yes, there would be a technical default on the debt. It would not be terrible. It would not be the end of the world. And yes, it has happened before. We have done this before and the world didn't end. Um, And it won't this time either. We will get the debt ceiling raised. There will be, you know, a a increase in the spending and the Treasury will ultimately have their money to go out and pay the interest on the debt. It will get done. People will still get their paychecks. Social Security checks will still go out. Military benefits will still go out. The whole nine yards. It'll all still happen. So, again, we've been here before. Nothing to worry about. Nothing to panic about. So when you hear this stuff in the media where people are, you know, running around waving their hands with their hair on fire, talking about the end of the world because if we don't raise the debt ceiling and spend more money, we're going to default on our debt. Just remember, it'll get done and it's happened before. So, and we're still here, amazingly enough. Another thing, 
Another piece of misnomer. The bill is paid for, right? This $1.2 trillion of, of spending for infrastructure is paid for, and the Build Back Better plan is going to be somehow magically paid for. No, it is not paid for. If it was paid for, let me just provide you a very simple analysis. Every time that we pass a bill of spending, right? Every time there's a spending bill that's passed, and this has been going on for 50 years, by the way. Every time we pass a spending bill, everybody touts, they go, the CBO, the CBO says they score it. And the CBO is, leaves out a whole lot of things and then <laughs> on the scoring. And then they also use unrealistic inflation rates, unrealistic interest rates, et cetera, and never account for a recession whatsoever. So, but if the CBO was even close to being correct and every bill that was passed was paid for, we would not have a two and a half trillion dollar deficit. Think about it. We would also not be spending over 100% of our revenues just covering social welfare in terms of Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, prescription drug benefits, and interest on the debt. That's the mandatory spending. That now requires more than 100% of the income that comes in just to cover those costs. And we're going to add more to that, by the way, when we start doing you know, more social spending for uh, paid medical leave and all these other things. And of course, any type of program that you start that is a give me to the economy is never sunsetted. It becomes permanent. So what will happen with a CBO score? They'll say, well, the Bid Back Better plan is, is paid for if all these programs end in two years. They won't. If you add this up and keep these running out over the course of the next decade, as they will do if it's passed, we're talking about a $5 trillion roughly spending bill. This is going to massively increase debt and inflation, and it is not paid for. So again, none of these things are paid for. Write this uh, $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill. It's paid for. No, it's not. It's $550 billion of new spending. The, uh, the remaining $700 billion was spending that we did that wasn't used for COVID. But that's still all issued on debt. And guess what? That wasn't paid for either. So <laughs> none of this is paid for. It all comes down to taxpayers. And of course, in the uh, Build Back Better plan is, of course, the reinstatement of the SALT deduction, which is where states that do not have a state income tax subsidize, subsidize the taxes of states that do. And, of course, for Californians, this new uh, increased amount of the SALT deduction to $72,000 is going to be a big benefit to the cons Democratic constituents in California because they will vastly benefit from this. And of course, the state of Texas, which does not have a state income tax, will happily subsidize those Californians for their salt tax. So there you go. <laughs> it's all the use of your tax dollars and where they go. When they come back uh, after the break, we'll get a little bit into the markets. We did candy coffee this past weekend. That video on the website now, if you missed out, we talked about the markets for next year. We have some questions that we're going to get into that we didn't get to cover there with Danny Ratliff. Be right back. So we had this uh, candy coffee over the weekend. That video is actually on the website, realinvestmentadvice.com. Uh, if you go there, it's right there on the homepage. And you can you know, watch that conversation that I had with Danny, with Richard, talk about the markets for next year. Well, and we were taking questions during this event, um, and we had a few questions that we didn't actually get to. So we're going to go through some of those questions this morning. But real quick, I, I want to clear up one thing because I always get emails about that statement that I made at the open talking about the SALT deduction and how states with that don't have an income tax, a state income tax, subsidize states that do. And then always get this email. I don't understand how that works. Well, the SALT deduction, which is the state and local income tax deduction. So if I live in California and I pay state income tax, when I file my federal taxes, I get a rebate for those state and local taxes. Right, So the government has to send those dollars out. So in Texas, we don't have a state income tax. So we don't get that benefit of being able to get a refund on our state and local taxes, which means that the tax dollars that Texans pay that go to the government that we don't get a rebate from or a deduction for go to the government who then turns around and sends them to the state of California. So that's $72,000 a person that individuals will get in California for their state and local income tax deduction will be paid for courtesy of 
red states that don't have a state income tax, like Florida, like Texas, like others. So that's that's what I mean by subsidizing. That money comes from somewhere. It just doesn't magically appear out of Peter Pan's left pocket. Okay? Why are you laughing, Danny? No, great analogy. <laughs> You've been full of them the last couple of days. I Yeah, I've been full of something the last couple of days. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's painkillers or just sarcasm. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, a couple of things to get into here. Um, you've got some questions that uh, we didn't quite get to uh, in our in our event last Saturday. And yep. I thought we could just go through some of those and answer those questions. And then, um, you know, we've got some other topics to get into as well. But I just thought we'd touch on those first. Yeah. So first and foremost, you know, Can of Coffee has been an event that, that we created essentially to answer questions right especially during covid where people weren't able to come in it was one of those environments where we thought you know what let's just open it up for just general questions have no preset or pre-formatted agenda and so it's become really popular in the sense that kind of like office hours so to speak <laughs> and um it's been good because we've get so many good questions it gives us a lot of great content and, and really it's also good to make us make sure that we understand what concerns you and so, you know, dealing with people each and every day and the moving parts within finance, it's really important. And so we got to a lot of questions, Lance, and a lot of them are really good. I may want to circle back on, on one or two of those as well, just to elaborate a little bit, because sure. even afterwards, we were getting questions like, hey, this was really good. You know, some of the things or concerns are taxes, right? right? Planning. What are we going to do right now? We've seen, it seems like everything's been scaled down quite a bit. The infrastructure bill was scaled back. This bill scaled back. What's the the likelihood in your eyes right now that you see we're going to see higher taxes this year mm -hmm. retroactive or will it be something that'll be potentially pushed back to 2022 if the democrats can't control both the house and the senate so this so that's an interesting question because last night i was uh emceeing a mergers and acquisition uh kind of event so mm -hmm. there's about you know 70 80 people at this event they're all bankers and and, and investment bankers and merger p business owners people that want to do m a type stuff and it was interesting because the entire conversation revolved around higher taxes everything kept coming back to well if tax rates go up and right now there's a massive surge we're, we're basically pushing record levels of m a and the whole time that i'm listening to this conversation that's going on i'm going you know, the last time that I heard all these same stats was in 2007, right? <laughs> you know, just before the Fed started hiking interest rates, just before, you know, all these things. But, you know, it was you know, very exuberant in the room. Boy, if you want to get a deal done, this is the time to do it. There's just money. There is literally money laying on streets. If you want to do an M&A deal, there's somebody willing to throw money at you regardless of what you're doing. Very interesting conversation. But it all kept revolving around taxes, but yet we haven't had any new taxes, right? There hasn't been a repeal of the Trump tax cuts. And we do have, and, and Danny, you can elaborate on this, but we do have some of the Trump tax cuts are going to sunset. And I'm not sure exactly what the dates are, but those sunsets on some of those taxes are coming up here in the next couple of years. But right now, there's not been any new taxes. There's lots of worry about new taxes, but we haven't seen any new tax rates coming. And the problem for the Democrats, of course, now is that if they want to try to pass a bill and they need bipartisan support at all for any reason, they can't hike taxes, right? Because the Republicans won't go along with new tax hikes. And it's interesting to listen to um, Joe Biden talk about the new infrastructure bill that just passed. He's like, any American with tax that doesn't have over $400,000 will have no taxes related to this bill. Well, there's no tax on people with over 400000 either. So why is why are you throwing that number out but the second thing is is that this also reminds me of george bush back right after the reagan administration and and his line that sank him ultimately in his re-election which is read my lips no new taxes right and this sounds very much similar to that um you know this is you know taxes always go up and when taxes do go up for any reason especially in, in this type of environment where you want to pay for multi-trillion dollars of spending they go up on everybody. It's not just people over 400000 and everybody else gets away with it. That's not the way tax, tax hikes uh, ever work. The problem going into the next couple of months, and one of the things that the markets are really kind of ignoring right now, is this debt ceiling issue, right? So Democrats have to raise the debt ceiling. They're losing support even internally inside of their own party for the Build Back Better plan. They've already got pushback from Joe Manchin and Cinema as well 
on this plan because look, more spending is going to create more inflation and inflation is a problem. And Senator Manchin was just on the, on television, I think last night talking about, hey, I just went to the gas pump and people are upset about what they're paying for gas. Yeah, they're paying, they're upset for what they're paying for gas because prices are going up. Retail sales yesterday up 1.7%. Those are nominal. So while the media was running around yesterday going, retail sales are strong, the consumer's back. No, that's inflation. People aren't buying more stuff, right? We don't measure it in the volume or quantity of things bought. We measure it in dollar value. People are paying a lot more at the pump for gas, right? You're paying 60 bucks for a tank of gas versus 40 bucks. That's 20 bucks extra in spending. I'm making up numbers, but you get the point. That's additional spending. That's why retail sales are growing up. So these are these are already taxes on individuals. These inflation is a tax on individuals. Inflation impacts everyone, and it impacts those at the bottom twenty percent that spend eighty to ninety percent of their income on essentials, even more than everybody else. So taxes are already going up. But I don't think, and, and again, I, I could be wrong. I think the Democrats are going to have a real tough time trying to raise taxes to any great magnitude. Um, we talked about Elon Musk for president on Monday because of his selling stock to pay his capital gains tax. And the fact that I think if they try to pass a capital gains tax and CEOs start selling their stock in mass and the market's down 20 or 30 percent, Democrats lose an election. Right. So th- I think they've got a real tough time going into and especially with midterms right around the corner as a long winded answer to say that I'm not sure they're going to get much passed here. Yeah, well, I think it's already a skeleton of what it once was. So yeah. we know that it's going to look a lot different from what the original bill, you know, this summer right. looked like. And, you know, we keep having these dates that they say, hey, this is it. We are we have to have it done by this date. We pushed it back from, you know, September. They issued a new bill September 13th. Then it was, you know, uh, October 1st, October 31st. Now here we are on the 17th of November and no, still we're, no we're, bill. We're going to have a vote next week, though. Of course. Like, like every week. week. Yeah. <laughs> every week. Yeah, I'm not sure we will. Uh, again, look, I could be wrong. They could try to shove something through. Um, they may get it through the House. I think the Senate's going to be the real problem. Yeah. Um, you know, again, I, who knows? Anything is possible. But, you know, I think this next couple of months is going to be very difficult. And with what's going on with the coming midterms and what's happening with some of these elections, I think the Democrats are getting really worried about re-election potential. Be right back after the break with Danny Ratliff. More questions coming up. Don't go away. So we were just talking a few minutes ago about, um, you know, kind of some of the questions from our candy coffee event we had this past weekend. So if you're just tuning in, go to the website, realinvestmentadvice.com. And uh, this past weekend, we did our candy coffee event. It's our outlook for, for next year. And we basically talked a lot about markets and what to expect next year. And we took a lot of questions. And we had so many questions coming in that we didn't have a chance to get to all of them. So we're going to play, we're playing a little bit of catch up today on those questions as well. So um, what's the, what, what was the next question on the list? Well, well, I want to tie up some loose ends on that last one from a tax okay. perspective. So you mentioned when does the Trump tax code sunset? Right. And so essentially that's 2026. So the end of 2025, you step into 2026, they revert back to those Obama era taxes. So we will see some changes if they do nothing at all, which they very well could and just say, hey, we're going to wait, do nothing. And essentially we're not going to be the bad guy mm-hmm. and taxes will go up automatically. But can they wait with all this new stimulus, all the money that they've thrown out? That's the million dollar question. Well, trillion dollar question, right? <laughs> yeah, trillion dollar question. So, so Lance, <laughs> we, you talked a little bit about the first segment. You talked about the infrastructure bill, some of the things that are in it, what that means. Uh, so question, a, lot of, a handful of questions around that. What does, where, where should someone invest? Is it too late? Is it, uh, are there areas that are primed to do very well in the future? Well, so two, that's a two-part question. Yep. So first part is is that infrastructure is never as shovel-ready as people think it is, right? And, re, and you know, initially what happens is, and this happened back in 2008 when Barack Obama passed the $800 billion uh, infrastructure bill. Um, what we found out a couple of years later was is that most of these jobs weren't as shovel-ready. We were going to we were building bridges to nowhere and doing other kinds of stuff. So. But initially, stocks are are going to respond to this idea that, oh, there's going to be all this spending, right? We're going to spend this trillion dollars and it's going to be great. Well, two things to remember, first of all, is that, you know, the spending is over a very long period of time. So it's not really a massive impact to earnings. It's not going to show up on the balance sheet and income statements of these companies immediately. Um, You know, Qualcomm's up 
you know, an extra $400 million because of broadband build out. That's not going to happen that way. It's, this is going to be spread out. It gets diluted. It really doesn't impact uh, corporate earnings that much. But again, market psychology and reality, two different things in the short term. And these things are already starting to move. Uh, companies like Deer and Caterpillar on the on the on the heavy equipment construction side um, is will, will, is benefiting. Qualcomm, um, who provides chips for 5G broadband build out, that's been running up sharply here over the course of the last few days. There's probably more room to go. These stocks are very overbought, though, so you need to wait for a little bit of a correctional, you know, kind of pullback here. I think we'll get one in the next couple of weeks. We'll see. Um, but, you know, try to just measure, you know, where you're chasing positions. There are some companies that haven't moved that may actually benefit from this build out longer term. Verizon, AT&T is a good example. They, you know, provide a lot of the bandwidth, um, you know, for 5G. Uh, Verizon, one of the leaders in the, in the providing of broadband Internet. So, you know, that company really hasn't moved that much yet. I, I'm not saying go out and buy it. Um, we just full disclosure, we own it in our portfolio already. But, you know, there are companies that, you know, get an initial pop because that's where speculative money is chasing. And then there's more fundamentally driven companies that may actually benefit well over the longer term. But of course, you know, you think about, you know, which companies are, are going to benefit the most. Well, companies that are going to be providing either materials or equipment or labor for the build out of these infrastructure products, uh, pro projects. So, you know, everything from cement to iron to um, contractors to equipment for building roads and bridges uh, on, on the 5G side, everything from the chips to the copper to everything else needed to build out internet. You know, that's just kind of start thinking about in those directions. There's ETFs that actually already cover the entire spectrum. So if you're just looking to buy a basket of stocks that uh, participate in, in these infrastructure supported projects. There's ETFs for that as well. So again, just think about, you know, it's kind of the old saying about, do I want to buy the gold? And this is, you know, one thing when gold was going up, there was a, a big saying out there for a while. It's like, don't worry about buying gold, buy the guys providing the picks and the shovels. Kind of the same thing for infrastructure. Don't worry about the broad issue. Find the guys that are providing the picks and the shovels for these broad these uh, infrastructure projects and again you know it's it's not as beneficial to economic growth as everybody makes it out to be because it's so spread out over time and again these projects they're very it takes a very long time to get through all the red tape to get them approved and in a lot of cases they never get approved and the money never gets spent so you know always kind of keep that in the back of your mind is that this is this is a slow drip, not a fast impulse of cash. Or it gets spent, but not in the right places. That's actually productive. Well, I wasn't going to say anything about fraud and waste, but you know. And, and by the way, Sheriff Joe, why do we have a president that nicknames himself? I don't understand this. But anyway, Sheriff Joe says he's going to be on top of the spending to make sure that he's going to personally oversee the spending to make sure that none of it is fraud and waste. Um, he can't remember which bill he was talking about, but he's going to make sure there's no fraud and waste in this bill. And he's now named himself Sheriff Joe on this issue. So. Excellent. I wonder which bright one that came up with that idea. Hey, we're going to start nicknaming ourselves. Yeah. Well, you know, most presidents nickname other people. Yeah. But he nicknames himself. So. Hey, it's great. Great to watch. Um, so, by the know, way, my new nickname is Sheriff Bob. So there, there you go. Sheriff Bob. Sheriff Bob. Okay. All right. And what are you policing? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the next question. That's what I'm Fa policing. Fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. So, so talk a little bit about infrastructure, places to invest. What about the year end push? You know, we're concerned with, um, you know, you talked a little bit just a bit ago about distributions mm -hmm. here year end and mutual funds, money managers will have to make. Where, where do you think they'll go? You know, historically, you know, people have pushed money into Apple. They pushed into some of these tech companies because they felt like, They've, there's no there's no other alternative to some extent. And it's still the case. Yeah. So you think that's going to still be the case in the future with these distributions and where they put funds back to work? Yeah. The, it, it, so, uh, you know, a couple of things there. First of all, is that we talked uh, uh, last week about money flows have been coming out of technology. And actually, we've seen a good bit of money transferring out of tech into other areas over the course of the last couple of months. So 
over the last week, we've seen that begin to reverse, and technology stocks are now outperforming the S&P as a whole. So we're already starting to see that transition back into technology, you know, and it kind of makes some sense in a way because, you know, you're moving into Christmas, so people buying, you know, iPhones and Macs mm -hmm. and these type of things, you, you kind of see the point. Um, but, the, but part of this has also been driven by Tesla uh, because of the move in Tesla. Uh, that's been part of it. The, the problem is right now is that the FANG stocks, uh, the kind of the top five, six, seven, eight stocks in the index, which now includes Tesla, by the way, now make up 30% of the entire index. So pretty much, you know, if you want to just beat the market or if you want to participate with the market, just buy the top 10 stocks of the index, right? That's what's going up and that's what keeps going up. Um, you know, so, you know, where money is going to go to, um, yeah, they're going to go back into these stocks for a couple of reasons. One, there is no volume in the market. This, this rally we've had in the market over the last few days has been on declining volume. It's been exceptionally weak, and that's what we call a lack of liquidity. There's buyers out there willing to buy stuff at this point, but if anybody shows up in mass to sell, there's no buyers willing to buy at these prices. Um, what will happen is you'll have a very sharp decline in the markets when selling actually begins to, to happen in earnest. And that's why when we do have sell-offs, we see these things pop up when markets are down 1.5% or 2% in a day. That's because there's no buyers there. That's that lack of liquidity. So for fund managers uh, and portfolio managers, us, we need areas that we can get into and out of very quickly without really having to suffer a big price decline. In other words, there's always a steady supply of buyers, and that's in those top six, or really kind of top 10 tech stocks in particular, because they're highly liquid. And you know, once you start to get down into the mid-tier of the S&P, or particularly at the lower tier of the S&P, that liquidity dries up very dramatically, and the ability to get out of a stock very quickly becomes very difficult. So um, yeah, so to your point, I think that, you know, we could see some a little bit of selling pressure first couple of weeks of December, as we usually do. That's not a guarantee, by the way. That's just historically speaking, statistically speaking, when distributions occur, particularly in a fairly illiquid market, probably we'll see some declines. That'll set us up for that in, end of year portfolio window dressing. And that's what's called the Santa Claus rally. And that last really kind of week of December as Portfolio managers, hedge funds, mutual funds get ready to report for the end of the year and they send out their quarterly statements to everybody. They need to make sure they own all the stocks that were big performers this year. So they'll put those on their books right at the end of the quarter. And that leads to this kind of Santa Claus rally that everybody talks about. So, again, I think you see a bit of a decline first couple of weeks of December, rally into the end of the year, and then next year all bets are off. Yeah. So we, we keep hearing this sentiment on, you know, for, for quite some time, in fact, about international stocks. So the next question we get back from the break is going to be a little bit about, are they actually cheap? And I know you you guys, you and Mike have ran analysis after analysis on this. And when's going to be the time to invest? I mean, we've seen how hard they got hit during COVID. Yeah. Um, all those fun things. All right. We'll, we'll that. That's actually a good question. We'll talk about international emerging markets when we come back from the break. Don't go away. And welcome back to the show. Uh, hanging out here with Danny Ratliff this morning, uh, catching up on our Candy Coffee event that we had this past Saturday. That video is on the website. If you go to realinvestmentadvice.com, right there at the top of the page are all of our videos, and you'll see one for Candy Coffee. And that is the replay event from this past weekend where we we're discussing our market outlook for 2022. And we're kind of catching up on some of the questions we didn't get to. Um, during that event. So again, go by the website and click on that event uh, link and, and enjoy that video there. And of course, uh, picking up some questions here, we left off talking about international emerging markets. Um, international and emerging markets have not performed well this year uh, relative to the S&P. Now, again, this is always very important and you have to be careful about analysis. So the question is basically, you know, if you listen to a lot of media analysts right now, there's a lot of conversation talking about how international emerging markets are cheap relative to the U.S. Now, that's where you got to be careful. They may be cheap relative to the U.S., but valuations are not, we don't compare valuations in the U.S. saying, oh, U.S. stocks are cheap relative to Europe, right? We just say, look, stock valuations in the U.S. are 40 times earnings, second highest level on record. Market cap to GDP, two and a half times economic growth. That's expensive. 
right? That's how we look at the U.S. We don't compare it to other countries. So when you're going to buy emerging markets, China, India, Russia, whatever, you can't look at their valuation of their stocks relative to the U.S. because their economies are different. You have to look at their valuations relative to their economies and their stocks are expensive. Importantly about emerging markets, inflation is a problem. As inflation goes up, the cost of goods being purchased by individuals gets more expensive and consumers have to consume less. Emerging markets are dependent upon exports for their income. Their economic growth comes from what they export. Primarily, the emerging markets are primarily exporters to other countries, industrialized international as well as the U.S., so you have to look at these factors relative to these countries. Now, am I saying you shouldn't own international and emerging markets? For us, that answer is right now is no, I wouldn't. And we don't own international and emerging markets in our portfolios because they have been underperforming the S&P. Now, this is where we start talking about asset allocation. And, of course, the, you know, Wall Street has been driving a narrative that you should just buy and hold an allocated basket of goods and, and you'll be fine. Just kind of ride the markets up and down. Don't worry about it. Because it's good for Wall Street. It's not necessarily good for you, but it's good for Wall Street because if you're just buying a bunch of, of stuff that they provide you, they're getting a fee on it and you're just suffering the returns. But over the last... 12 years, international and emerging markets have been a boat anchor on the performance of your portfolio. If you take a look, just simply do the math, do the work yourself. Go pull up a chart, go to stockcharts.com, pull up an S&P 500 chart um, on, on stock charts, and then overlay a chart of international and a chart of emerging markets going back to 2009. And what you will see is a massive underperformance. So if you had those equally weighted in your portfolio, your S&P has done well, international emerging markets not so much, so your overall return is lower than just being invested domestically. And that's why we don't own it, because we're looking to maximize our performance with the least amount of risk possible. Having said that, underperforming assets in one year tend to eventually outperform in another year. The question is when. Last year, we talked about Nobody wanted to own energy stocks last year. Last year, energy stocks were the death, right? Oh, I can't believe you own energy stocks. You just, you know, they're terrible. They're all going out of business. This year, they're their best performing asset class, not by a little, by a massive amount. So that's, that's generally the case, is that, you know, one thing to be looking for is opportunistic investing, where asset classes or countries or whatever have been beaten down to a great degree and have underperformed. But again, you can't just say, oh, it's been underperforming, so now it'll outperform. It doesn't always work that way. Right now, there may be some tradable opportunities in international emerging markets next year. But again, it may be a very short-lived transition depending on inflation. And as we talked about before on the show, if the U.S. gets a cold because of inflation, because of the Fed hiking rates, because of um, you know, uh, you know, lack of spending, whatever it is. If we get a cold, everybody else gets a flu because all these other countries, China, emerging markets in general, are all dependent on the U.S. to sell their products. We're a bit, we're a, we are the consumer for all these other countries. So if we get a cold, they get the flu, which means those stocks will underperform. So. We're very late in this cycle, and the more the most important thing right now is about rather than trying to speculate and chase returns, wait for these markets to tell you what's opportunistic, invest opportunistically, and beware of the risk. Yeah, and large cap value international, just in general, everybody's been saying, hey, this is such a great buy because it is so cheap. But like you mentioned, it's cheap for a reason. Yeah. I mean, I think I've heard that same question, that same story since like 2015. Yeah. So it's been some time. Every, every year. Yeah. Every year. Every year it's the same way. It's yeah. cheap. Exactly, exactly. So, um, you know, talk about green energy a little bit. We've seen this huge, massive run up in green energy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in our portfolio here, we own some lithium stocks, uh, Albert Marley, full disclosure, right. uh, LIT, you know, ETF. What about other areas, uranium, other places? You know, is this a bubble that we're seeing right now? Is there potential for, you know, quite a bit of a pullback? Or are these investments that are just going to keep on running? Well, 
we always think that something is going to keep on running forever once it starts running, and, yep. th- and that's the whole idea. Um, you know, th- those things never occur. Uh, you always get a correction because there's going to be a point where reality kind of collides with the fantasy. Mm-hmm. Um, Tesla is a great example of this. I mean, you know, you know, Tesla is an awesome company. I don't have any problem with it, uh, but you know, it's it te- the the function of Tesla cannot be valued at more than every other automaker combined, which it is right now. They they are regardless of what you want to call them, you can call them a pink elephant, but Tesla is an automaker. And eventually, it will succumb to the dynamics of the automaking market at whatever point that 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 happens. But same idea with green energy. Green energy is not efficient. It is not, you know, ecologically sound and it's not environmentally clean. And no matter what form you want to take look at, whether it's wind power, solar power, electric vehicles, these are not climate friendly productions because they require either a massive amount of, of mining <laughs> deforestation or they require an immense amount of petroleum product to build their to build those units right so you know these this is going to be the reality is that the inefficiency of these issues is going to start to push capital back towards petroleum and ultimately coal in fact we're already starting to see the coal movement now so if i was going to be an investor i would probably be starting to look back towards coal um, as a potential viable tradable opportunity, not necessarily today, but something I'm watching close on the radar because as people realize that green energy is not as efficient as coal and oil for producing energy, especially when it comes to warming your house, driving your car, and more importantly, keeping your lights on, <laughs> you know, that's where I think we'll see a shift of capital. You know, look, the green energy revolution is here. That's not going away. You know, this is going to be a thing. Uh, but valuations, the speculation in these industries are exceedingly overdone. And when there's a and we, look, we saw this with solar a while back when when we started initially talking about the transition to solar energy, these solar stocks took off and they had huge runs and it was going to be the the next coming of the of the 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 world of investing. Then they all crashed and they crashed huge. Um, now they're starting to come back a little bit. A, a good example is go take a comp- look at a, a company like Plug Power or Ballard Power. These stocks had huge runs when they first IPO. They thought this was the new transition. They crashed and some of them are still trading at exceedingly low valuations. So you know, we're going to go through this bust and bubble uh, type of cycle in green energy, and and it's fine. But just understand that you're that you're not paying for the new technology. Tesla is not a technology company; they're an auto company. They will ultimately succumb to the dynamics of the auto market. And as you get more and more of these companies that are providing green energy, climate change type solutions, that will dilute opportunity within the markets. And eventually, fundamentals will creep up with the fantasy. And when those two collide, it will not be pretty for stock prices. Again, this is just a function of how markets work. So enjoy the ride for now. Just understand that what goes parabolic in one direction tends to go parabolic in the other direction at some point. So, Well, a lot of this could be political subsidies, just like you mentioned, solar power. That's the sure. Obama administration's mm-hmm. their big uh, push. Same thing we're seeing here. Now, the green energy has been certainly been here. But what about when we get this volatility? You know, we're, Now we see this big dichotomy on what happens. Do we look at, do we go to gold? Is that the safe place? Or is it crypto? Well, that's that's the that's the that's the what is it today? That is the sixty thousand five hundred forty dollar question on Bitcoin, <laughs> because gold. You know, we've been watching gold very closely in our office because of the, you know, normally when you're having running rates of inflation and negative real rates, which we have right now. In fact, I just did a chart for an article I've got coming out next week. We now have negative six percent savings rates on money market accounts, which the only other time that has occurred is at the late in 1978 during the oil crisis embargo when we had 15% inflation. So because rates were so low going into this problem to start with, we now have the same negative dynamics on savings that we had during the massive inflation push, uh, you know, in the late 70s. So Gold should be gold should be three thousand dollars an ounce right now. It's not, and in fact, there's not really much of a demand for gold in terms of market market demand at the moment, because people are so so involved in speculating in asset. But why would I own gold when stocks are going up? You know, twenty five percent a year. That doesn't make any sense. Why would I want to own gold when you know Bitcoin's gone up a hundred percent since its lows earlier this year? 
It's all about this speculative drive in the markets. Ultimately, that breaks, and I think gold becomes a really great buying opportunity. It's just not today. Yeah. Makes me kind of want to go buy some gold. Kind of makes you do. Yeah. All right. That wraps up the show today. Danny, thanks so much. Glad you're back. Yes, sir. Good to be here. It's going to be a regular deal. You coming back? It is. All right. Awesome. Uh, be sure by the website, Candy Coffee. It's on the website now, right on the homepage, realinvestmentadvice.com. Download. You basically click on that video link and watch our Candy Coffee event, our outlook for 2021. We cover a lot of ground uh, in that one hour on that video. It's on the website now, realinvestmentadvice.com. Of course, send my, myself or Danny any questions you have. I'm always happy to help you out. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Just uh, right there at the top is a form you can fill out. Ask any question you want. We'll answer it for you. Make sure you're taken care of. And, uh, of course, while you're there, check out all of our blog posts, our newsletter. Make sure you register for our weekly newsletter as well. And get our daily commentary. It comes out every morning before the market. Realinvestmentadvice.com. See you tomorrow.